Shakespeare got it almost completely wrong. You could say that the speech given by John of Gaunt on his deathbed in Richard II is perhaps the greatest evocation of an island race. And of what made England so unique, so great, and so protected from all forms of contagion. This fortress, built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house. Magnificent inspirational verse. Yet it couldn't have been more young. It gives the impression of an exceptionalism enjoyed by England, a demi paradise secure from disease and, more importantly, from political infection. Sound similar to many political views held today. Yet, the historical John of Gaunt lived through the ravages of the Black Death, and Shakespeare himself had survived outbreaks of the plague that had closed the theatres on which his livelihood depended. And he lived in a society where England's dependence on the sea had brought in new diseases. The sea was not only a moat, a defence against invasion and a barrier to the spread of disease, but sea travel was what preached these defences. Well, the Black Death struck Western Europe with great ferocity in 1346. It killed perhaps a third of the population in the space of only three years. It appears to have started off in Mongolia and was then carried by the Tartar hordes to the Crimean Isthmus. There they besieged a small group of genuine merchants in the trading post of Kaffa. Plague swiftly broke out in the besieged port. According to one account, it was deliberately introduced among the genuine traders by a form of biological warfare. The Tartars used giant catapults to lob their infected corpses over the walls of Kaffa. The Genoese then carried these rotting bodies through the town and dropped them in the sea. But by then, the infection had caught hold. The siege was only ended when the Tartars dispersed, spreading the plague as far afield as Russia, India and China. The Italian merchants who survived both siege and pestilence fled by ship back to Italy, carrying with them a deadly hidden cargo. Some of them landed in Sicily, where the plague in Italy initially struck. But soon Genoa itself, their home state, was to be devastated. It was widely believed that the plague brought on these accursed galleys was a punishment from God since these same galleys had helped the Turks and Saracens to take the city of Romanes, and the Genoese there had wrought much more slaughter 
on the Christians than even the Saracens had done. Well, the Black Death soon spread from this focus of infection to the areas with which it had trading links. Constantinople, Messina, Venice, Sardinia, Marseille. It was later claimed that the Genoese had driven the infected galleys away from the port as soon as they realised what they were carrying. They were driven forth from the port by burning arrows and divers and engines of war, for no man dared touch them, nor was any man able to trade with them, for he did, he was sure to die. Very quickly, the epidemic spread along the trade routes of the Mediterranean and Northern Europe. From Sicily, it spread to Tunisia, to the Italian mainland, to Provence. And by the summer of 1348, it had reached the Iberian Peninsula, Northern France, and the Southern port, England. By 1349, it had reached the Low Countries, Norway and Germany. Sweden and the Western Baltic in 1350. And then the Eastern Baltic and Northern Poland in 1351. Essentially, its progress followed the main trade route of the Black Sea, Mediterranean, North Sea and Baltic. It always first appeared in the ports and then spread more slowly along roads and rivers to inland towns and the surrounding countryside. This devastating epidemic known as the Black Death has been identified with bubonic plague transmitted by the bite of the human fee, Pulex irritans, which had been infected from black rats carrying the bacterium. In the 19th century, the infected bacterium was identified as Yersinia pestis. The black rat, Ratus ratus, established burrows near supplies of grain or flour. And they were then bitten by fleas, which transmitted the infection to human beings. It's notable that bakers and millers were often the first victims of the outbreak of the plague. The illness was characterized by the formation of swellings in the groin or in the armpit. In the pneumonic form, which could be passed by coughing, it affected the lungs directly and the victim could cough up blood. Even more serious was septicemic plague, in which the bacterium entered the bloodstream and swiftly killed the person infected. In the 14th century, many of the victims of the Black Death were covered with small black pustules and had little hope of survival. By contrast, those who were afflicted with hard dry boils or abscesses had a greater chance of survival. Now, this range of symptoms suggests that there was more than one form of the disease. For many of the victims, the illness began with them feeling cold and experiencing a tingling sensation. This was then followed by the appearance of hard, solid boils, ulcers, and pustules in the groin and armpit. Fever followed, many people vomited blood. Indeed, anyone who coughed up blood was likely to die. So extensive was this epidemic that no one could be found to carry the bodies of the dead to burial. 
but men and women carried the bodies of their own little ones to church on their shoulders and threw them into mass graves, from which rose such a stink that it was barely possible for anyone to go past the churchyard. On the outskirts of the city of London, there were plague pits. The plague had reached England in the early summer of 1348, brought by sea to the Dorset port of Melkin Regis by a merchant vessel, John Gascony. By November, it had reached London and then spread through the country. Mortality peaked in the spring and early summer of 1349. The population overnight was reduced by about a third. Villages were depopulated and abandoned, fields left untended, and tax revenues fell. Now, given time, the English economy and social structure could have recovered, but there were recurrent outbreaks of the plague, especially in 1360 to 62, 1369 and 1375. And these had more lasting effects. Labour became scarcer. The peasants who survived were able to demand a better return for their hire. Rents and food prices fell. Ultimately, living standards rose. The psychological effects, though, were perhaps less positive in the long term. To the medieval mind, the sudden and devastating advent of the Black Death was seen as a punishment from God for moral transgressions and was the harbinger of the apocalypse. The pious were encouraged to go on pilgrimage, just like Geoffrey Chaucer and his fellow pilgrimage in the Canterbury Tales, who went to seek the intercession of those saints who them hath holpen one that they would seek. Meanwhile, processions of flagellants travelled from town to town, whipping themselves in a formal procession as they went along. In religious art, the theme of the dance macabre became popular, in which death holds out his hand to the living from all ranks of society. It's a reminder that mortality could strike anyone at any time. Inevitably, scapegoats were found, especially groups seen as outsiders and unclean. These included foreigners, who were not only alien, but had come along the sea routes which now brought disease. Muslims in Spain were targeted. And also the practitioners of such foul trades as prostitution, butchers, tanners and fishermongers. The Jews were specially singled out. Many of them were expelled, but at Strasbourg, 900 Jews were burned to life on St. Valentine's Day, 1349, in a futile attempt to avert the Black Death. Pope Clement VI believed that the Black Death was caused by demons trapped in steel chained mirrors. It all sounds a bit like modern superstitions that 5G masks had spread coronavirus. And some of the air uh, cures was unorthodox as President Trump's talk about injecting disinfectants, drinking disinfectants and using UV rays 
he'd have probably had quite a lot in common with Pope Clement. Physicians, though, saw the plague in terms of pestilential fever and fitted it into the classic Galenic theories the disease was caused by an imbalance of the humours. It was thought to have been caused by an increase in the hotness of the heart, which would be exacerbated by miasmas and noxious vapours produced by the corruption of the air caused by rotting matter, an excess of humidity and the foul breath of the sick. In 1398, in many towns in Italy and Oregon, the streets were swept clean, of human excrement, butcher's offal, and a leather worker's refuse. An attempt was also made to ensure that the putrefying bodies of black death victims were swiftly buried. All of them sensible moods. The Talon Blackheads were a body of young unmarried German ship owners and merchants who banded together in the 14th century to form brotherhoods of blackheads under the patronage of St. Maurice in the Hanseatic towns of the Balkans. The Tallinn blackheads erected a triptych altarpiece dedicated to the Virgin Mary in the Dominican monastery of St. Catherine. In it, St. Gertrude, patron saint of the sick in hospitals, is depicted with a rat at her feet in reference to her supposed ability to drive away plague carrying rodents. Well, as the Black Death progressed and subsequent outbreaks of plague broke out, civil magistrates took steps to prevent disease being brought by ship to their cities. In 1348, Venice appointed three guardians of the public health with powers to inspect ships crews for evidence of infection and impose isolation on any ships with sick crew or passengers. In 1377, the Republic of Ragusa introduced a 30-day quarantine against travellers to Dubrovnik coming from plague-stricken areas. This period of quarantine was raised to the biblical 40 days in 1397 following the example of Marseille, which in 1383 had introduced what would then become the standard period of isolation. So self-isolation is nothing new. It was the response in the 14th century to the plague. Quarantine detention stations were established at Pisa in 1464 near the Church of San Lazaro, given the world the term Lazaretto for such quarantine places. Lazarettos were not only used to isolate the sailors and passengers from ships, but plague victims from an infected city would also be sent to them, when despite all precautions, the Black Death struck. In Edinburgh, an official known as the Faulus Krenger was appointed to dispatch plague victims to quarantine, destroy their contaminated chattels and disinfect their houses. Rocco Benedetti, a Venetian notary, in 1577 described the Lazaretto Vecchio in the Ven Venice Lagoon to which sufferers from the plague were sent, as like hell itself, with its stench that none could endure, the groans and sighs of the sick, and the clouds of smoke from the burning corpses. 
quarantine chain was perhaps the most effective preventative that they had been. Well, there are parallels with approaches to the Black Death and with some attitudes today. It w the Black Death wasn't the first time that serious mass epidemics had struck Western Europe, but it had a profound psychological effect. It changed the economy, it changed the world. And that's something infection can do.